Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third podcast and a happy new year, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, happy new year, everybody. Happy new year. Uh, it's an exciting year. You know, we wish you all the best gains possible. I might talk a little bit differently today because I got my wisdom teeth removed. So if I sound a bit weird, that's why. And uh, I used to look like Quackmire like a few days ago, but uh, that's fixed now. Anyway, you guys got a bunch of questions. And Josh and I are ready to answer those. Are you ready, Josh? Oh, dude, always. If I'm a little off, it's because I've flipped from nights to days and now back to nights over the past couple of days. So, I'm feeling it. Uh, maybe that's favorite. a maybe that's a good last question for me on how to <laughs> how to change your like your uh, your your uh, cycle sleepy cycle. But we'll do that later. Yeah. First, the questions from the community because they are important. Uh, the first one is from Thomas Darjant. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asked, what would be a good angle to start training in the planche leans? Starting from no lean and ultimately adding six inches feel like there's still room for progress. Yeah, so I mean, if you started in a push-up position, all you're going to do is progressively move forward more and more and more without changing anything else about your body. The big thing to do is to make sure that the pressure you know, stays on the part of your hand that's closest to your hips. So if your fingers are forward, that means the pressure is here. If your fingers are backwards, that means that the pressure is here. If your hands are out sideways, that means that the pressure is here. You know, and don't be extreme. Don't put it on the side of your hand. Just make sure that it doesn't move forward. You start with the weight close to the hips in terms of where it is on your hand, and you keep it there as you go into the lean. And that's super important. That's important for everything from dynamic skills, like going through uh, swinging dips, dimadovs, whatever you want to think about, however high up you go, Knowing where to place and keep your weight is important. And if you strain it, if you train it from the beginning, before you know it, it's just how you do it. You're not really thinking about it anymore, and it never goes wrong, and you just keep making progress. Then the only thing is programming, you know. But if you're sitting there and you're fighting against yourself because you haven't actually stopped and thought, "Geez, where's my weight centered?" Then this is an impossible question to answer because that was never the issue. The issue was that you didn't actually know how to do the lean properly. Yeah. You know what I mean? So priority one learn a good lean that should always be the first place that you start and you know the the minimum volume there is hard to describe because you're not really leaning very hard so it's not a huge physical challenge you know the uh if you wanted to do it by numbers then i would say that your first goal should be to build up to like five to seven holds three days a week just so that you have a little bit of time off in between, you know, and that's, that's like for the first month. And then after that, during the second month, I would take some of those holds and we would say, let's say that's, uh, you know, 21 holds total, right? Seven times three, 21. So let's say, okay, well, I want to be practicing this every day. So then on the days that you don't do it, I would start doing two holds. Don't increase anything else. Don't change those three days you're already training. And then you do that for a couple of weeks, and then you add another hold. And so before you know it, you're doing five or six holds, six, seven days a week. You're not getting hurt because you're not trying to push things very hard. And to me, taking it slow and steady like that and introducing it is important because that's how you learn. And it's also how you're going to see the strength that you build make progress. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. So would you recommend someone to start uh, all the way from push-up position and then yeah. slowly through weeks add lean or do they already add a little bit of lean? No, no, no. Yeah, no, that's okay. That's a different question. Yeah. So when you're first starting off, the first thing you should do is figure out where you can hold a lean comfortably for at least 15 seconds without <laughs> feeling anything in your elbows. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it? Yeah, either that or... So you're going to hit one of two spots. You're either going to hit a spot where you start to feel some elbow strain. You need to back off with that a little bit. The yeah. other thing that's going to happen is that you may enter a spot where you don't feel elbow strain, but all of a sudden the position just feels wrong. Don't do that either. Yeah, yeah I, I feel you. You know what I'm saying? Those are the two things you want to avoid. So you start off figuring out how much lean you can handle with good form, if that makes sense. Yeah, From that makes there, sense. you go into a slow, steady progression. And when you talk about easing into the volume, 
that's a very difficult thing to answer because everybody's in a different place. <clears throat> my, my suggestion is to not add more than like four holds a week. And as long as you kind of stick to that one rule and you're not trying to add holds and add time in the same week, then, you know, you're not going to run into too many problems unless you're really being dumb, which can happen. You know, it's not intentional stupidity, but people still make bad decisions and think, well, I'll just keep adding stuff. And all of a sudden I'm doing 70 planges three times a day. And I wonder why my arms are fell off at the elbows, you know, and that <laughs> just, you can take anything too far. So don't be stupid. Yeah. But take it slow, and when you feel like you're in a good groove and you're making steady progress, just keep doing what you're doing. There is such a thing as too much, and more people do too much than too little. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? That that would be my advice. Cool. And that's that's how I always teach pretty much everything. Looks like we covered that question from Thomas Darshant. Hope we, uh, hope you're that's to your liking. The next question. This name is pretty cool. I don't, I don't think I can pronounce it though. It's uh, Rago Lass. It's a really cool name. Uh, how would you go about fixing interior pelvic tilt and forward head posture? Woo! That's uh, oh man. All woo! right. Well, we you can, can write a book. Yeah. <laughs> on that. So without writing a book, the number one thing that you need to be doing for the anterior pelvic tilt is you have to maintain a neutral or even slightly flexed spine while you do hip flexor stretches. Don't overthink this. The main hip flexor you're gonna be stretching is gonna be the rectus femoris. You are going to feel it in the upper middle thigh. That's, I don't mean like on the inside of your thigh. I literally mean like if, if, <laughs> if this is your thigh, it's gonna be right smack down the middle on the upper half. and that's you're gonna feel that and that's normal and that's going to be where you make your progress the other thing that you need to do is not stretch the hamstrings right stretch the front do not stretch the back the last thing you want to do is uh, it, you, the point is that you're trying to unbalance tension you know everybody says stuff about strong weak tight loose those are kind of bullshit terms in a way because it's usually not a raw strength issue and it's usually not a uh it's not a physical thing what happens is our nerves have basically learned through these reflex loops that where you're at is where everything is overall stable and it shouldn't be but that's what you've learned that's where you're at right now if you have big anterior tilt that's what you've learned so you're reprogramming those nervous reflexes, and that just means stretching. Stretching is not trying to make a rubber band more pliable. Stretching is saying, okay, nerves, pay attention. I'm holding this, and I'm not dying, so I'm in a good space. This is okay. And they learn that, right? Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is that your hamstrings will start taking more tension temporarily, and everything moves the other way until you level things out. And... Then when you're leveled out, you can start stretching your hamstrings again, but keep stretching your hip flexors. And always stretch your hip flexors after your hamstrings if you have anterior hip flex or anterior pelvic tilt. If you're one of the less common people who has posterior tilt, you do it opposite. You want to stretch your hamstrings, not stretch your hip flexors very much, and then you would be one of those very unusual people by comparison where I would say, I want you to stretch, you know, your hip flexors first, if that's something that you need to do for your goals, and then stretch your hamstrings afterwards. See what I'm saying? Because if their hamstrings are rolling them back, we don't want their body to remember, oh, these need to hold more tension. Yeah. We want their body to stay leveled out where we got it. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It's like they, they are balanced. They're just balanced in a disadvantaged position because it creates a lot of contact pressure on the back of the lumbar spine. That's what you want to alleviate because that's where you run into problems over time. That's okay. where you get stress fractures in the lower back. It's it's in the vertebral arch. And then the the bodies of the vertebrae, which are like these big, heavy hockey puck looking things, are, they're kind of free to slide around. They're held together by, by bony bridges on the back. And then once those crack... You slide and you start compressing the spine and you, you you have horrible, horrible, like worse than sciatica issues. You can have uh, major problems that if they're not fixed and some people can be permanent. So uh, you don't want to screw around with stuff like that. 
you just want to make sure that you stretch your hip flexors if you have anterior pelvic tilt and you do it without arching your back if you arch your back you're still in tilt you know what i'm saying that's the biggest mistake people make and as soon as i work with somebody and we correct that all of a sudden like magic things start getting better cool what so, about yeah. uh, what about the forward head posture the forward head posture is a different issue in some ways they do tend to go together because your spine if you curve one part all the rest tends to curve with it because if it doesn't then you end up in this weird position to where you're either going to fall backwards or fall forwards because your whole trunk is tilted and so to keep the appearance of being upright you know which is basically keeping your weight over your feet you end up exaggerating all the curves and it's not necessarily every single curve, but a couple of different curves are going to get exaggerated. And so if you're rolled way forward and you're leaned way back, you know, you have to curl forward. And a lot of times that brings the head with it. Yeah. Because if the thoracic spine curls a lot, then the cervical spine kind of, it's weird. Part of it flexes and part of it extends and it's a very uncomfortable thing and uh, creates a very unstable position for the shoulder blade to try and operate in. So people with... Uh, the the um head forward usually have a lot of shoulder problems and they also have a lot of problems kind of getting stronger and as soon as you fix those things yep they, they get better so i actually um because of uh my teeth i haven't been working out properly and i've been sitting behind my computer for a long time trying to ignore the pain you know playing games etc my forward head posture it's like getting back a little bit like, like this is me relax yeah. see that yeah and it, and now and, so you can yeah. see this is where it's supposed to be it's pretty good now like this but it's pretty hard to maintain this now and so i'm i'm certain that if i go work out now full volume uh, i'm gonna hurt my shoulders so i'm gonna have to do a few days of fixing this yeah before you would have I, to pay more attention yeah it's just oh, you know? know and it's like everybody makes this mistake of thinking you're supposed to flatten the whole spine out and all this crap and that's not true yeah each area has a curve that's supposed to be there and, how can, uh, can you give some cues on how to easily do a forward half posture correction? Like, Yeah, the easiest thing first is stretch your hip flexors to make sure that you are kind of straightening out the lower half of your spine. Okay. And then the second thing will be that, um, and, and so that's assuming you have a anterior not pelvic posterior tilt. tilt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm saying not posterior tilt. And the reason that I'm saying it that way is that uh, a lot of people will look at themselves and think, well, I don't have anterior pelvic tilt. And the truth is that if I sit there and put my fingers on your bony prominences, you probably do. It's just not causing you problems. And yeah. that's okay. But you have a forward head posture, and that tends to be a part of the anterior pelvic tilt. So if we want to attack the, the, the forward head posture, we should also look at the pelvic tilt just to see if it's an issue. That's and interesting. the best, you know what I mean? The, the, the best way to do that, unless you have a super duper flat lower back, and I mean the bones, not how it looks. Because if you have a lot of muscle, it'll look different than the bones are. Yeah. So, but that, so my first thing would be to do some hip flexor stretching for like a minute on each side. Okay. Then what you do, is you're going to feel like you're standing straighter. The whole spine is going to kind of feel kind of weird for a second because you've taken this excess tension away. And the second thing you're going to do is you're going to make this L with your hand like you're telling somebody they're a loser. But instead, what you're going to do is you're going to take this on, basically, I like to do the lip and the eyebrow. And you want to pull the lip a little further back than the eyebrow. But they both come back. And here's a cool thing. Instead of like trying to think of muscles or bones or any of this shit, when you look at something and you just say, I need to move away from that, Two yeah. things are going to happen. One, your head's going to go back, but you can also kind of feel your spine tensing up in certain areas. And so if you just kind of relax that, but keep your head back, before you know it, you kind of figure out, oh, crap. Now there's this stuff up here working that wasn't working before. And you start undoing those weird compensations that you've built up over the years. And that's a really, really easy and simple thing to do. And it's one of the things that we had everybody do in the first seminar and uh, it immediately fixes a lot of form issues. Yes, and it does. It also makes exercises easier after a couple of weeks if you had a head posture issue. Yeah, you know, so that that takes that's a big deal, and it's very simple. So I would definitely make sure that you use the finger trick, and you can figure out. You know, you may like kind of like nose and chin. I don't know. I've just found that finger like the lower lip 
and between the eyes is just for, for me it's uh what i think of as this partial this part of my uh body so the neck part i try to mm-hmm. think that i'm pulling it like this and then yes what, it, what it's whatever you want to do yeah, i mean that, that's you, my you trick. Just, so whatever you, you guys have, want yeah the, here's the thing the tricks that you use in the beginning are not necessarily going to be the tricks you use later on. Yes. At first, you may have to focus on body parts, but that's not a good idea long term. So first, you just get things moving forward. And eventually, you want to try and figure out how to move your cues from saying, I need to do this with my body, to just saying, I just need to be, I need to stay straight, head away from the hand. And when you do that, you don't have to focus on any particular area, so you're not stealing power. That sounds like bullshit, right? But here's the thing. What research shows us is that if you focus on a muscle, guess what? That muscle is going to work more. And the other muscles around it are not going to be able to kick in properly. It doesn't mean they don't work at all. It just means that you're basically redistribute. You're trying to do everything with that muscle in that exercise. So and you're that telling- ends up putting you in a situation, right, where you're artificially limiting your strength. And it actually does reduce neural drive to the other muscles. So it's not that they don't work, but they can't reach peak activity and you focus tension where it maybe doesn't totally belong. See what I'm saying? So yeah. sometimes, especially in rehab, you do have to start off with things like, I want you to rotate your shoulder or blah, blah, blah. And, and that can be helpful. But what I find even in the beginning is that if you're with somebody and you say, you know what? I want you to pull your shoulder. I want you to, instead of telling them to pull their shoulder blades apart, you know, or squeeze them together or something. I just touch their shoulder or th- their collarbones and just say, I just want you to pull that back, pull the collarbone back. And they actually move better, faster, with less tension, and it's easier to remember. And they can do it themselves at home and they don't run into problems. So there's a lot of things to where when, when you just, when I just say pull your collarbones back, we all know your collarbones aren't muscles, right? Like, you want your traps to work, but instead of telling you to focus on your traps where things get all screwbally real quick, if I just tell you this spot here, pull it back away and don't move anything else, guess what? It's pretty easy to do, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, my shoulders feel really good. That like worked easy. Those are things that you really want to pay attention to, and as you learn that, you realize that there's a sequence of these things that you get to where all you're eventually thinking is, I'm straight. From head to toe, and that doesn't mean no curves, it just means neutral for you. And then I'm pushing myself away from the ground, and I'm not even focused on my body. I'm focused on where my hand meets the ground, and that spot is moving toward and away from me. And all of a sudden, you're doing planche push ups, and it doesn't feel like you're doing anywhere near as much as it felt like when you were doing pseudo planche trying to focus on your shoulders. And that's the difference is that when you, 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 the, the reason these are complex questions is that if I just say one thing and let it go, people are going to hang their hat on it. And they're going to say, here we go. I'm just going to do this. And then I get a little bit better, but I still have problems. And you still have problems because that was step one. You know, it may not even have been the right step one. That was just a common thing that people are used to hearing. Whereas the truth is that we need to find ways to create external cues, not cues that focus on a particular muscle group. You know what I mean? Yeah, or yeah. Or like yeah. a joint or something like that. You get all screwed up. Yeah. Yeah, I right. even notice it with my shoulders. You know, it makes a huge same, difference. Same. It just thinks like, oh well, if I have, I want to touch the ceiling with a ball that I'm holding, and in, and I don't give a shit about my shoulder or anything else. I just want to to take the any feeling of particular tension out and just make that ball go higher. So I feel where the ball is, and all of a sudden, without any particular tension where I would normally get impingement I feel nothing and everything lifts further up so it's one of those things that uh, you don't hear talked about anywhere it's not on the radar and it's one of the real secrets that successful athletes don't know they're doing because they're not thinking that's the point yeah that's the point that's what you have to get to and that's that's what I want to guide you to all right, man. I think we yeah. uh, covered that question uh, pretty well. We got to move on, though, because we've got a bunch of other questions. Uh, this next question is from Brian Sheng. And he asks, 
How would you program weighted calisthenics for sustainable progress? Is there a certain protocol you follow in order to increase weight? How will this differ from a beginner athlete and a more advanced athlete who is pulling heavier weights? So he's asking. Uh, well, uh, yeah. So he's asking a couple of things there. The the first answer is that a beginner is always going to increase weight faster than a uh, advanced athlete. Yeah. And the main reason for that is that the beginner has all these neural adaptations that are going on, and they also are building muscle at a proportionally faster rate. So, like when they start eating for gains they're eating a lot more protein for the muscle mass that they have and their body has not developed what we call anabolic resistance. Mm -hmm. And they also have a lot of coordination gains to make, if that makes sense. And so the combination of all those things means that usually in the course of three months, a beginner will easily double their strength in most of their exercises. No problem. So if you have somebody coming in who's squatting 150, it is not unusual to see them squatting 300 pounds in three to six months. And people think, oh, my God, what a beast. And, like, no, the beasts are the people who come in squatting 300, and then, like, a year later, they're squatting 500. Like, that's kind of weird. And then a year after that, they're squatting 700 and winning a meet. And that's unusual. But when you're talking about uh, the typical beginner, what ends up happening is they just uh, – their, their body has more places to make gains and less resistance to those gains. You know, is a simple way to put it. For, for a more advanced athlete, you're seeing this happen more and more and more in all of the high-level strength power sports, is that most of the year, people are training with higher volume and lower weights. And then, and that doesn't mean that they're putting, you know, five-pound dumbbells in their hands. It just means that, you know, if their competition squat is 800, they're not training with 600 pounds because that's 75 percent that's not that much right but 600 pounds is still a lot of pounds yeah and so they're training with like 400 and they're doing 15 20 reps a lot of the times with stuff like that and they may be manipulating different variables and doing different things so different people are of course different and when you get up into these very very heavy weights there's there's a little bit of difference in how uh the rep scale but the main point I want to make is that compared to what they would do in a competition taper where they're looking to peak and take the year of gains or really the last nine months of gains and get it ready to show off three months from now. Because you got to realize if you go into any elite powerlifting gym and say, guys, I want to work out and I want to compete and I want to break records. How often can I go to a competition? They're going to tell you one or two times a year, max. Yes, yeah, yeah. And a lot of times they're going to say, you really shouldn't even, uh, if you're going to compete, you should just treat it as a workout. Don't do a taper. You need a couple of years of basic strength. And then when you're starting to get up there and you're competitive, now we can start working on this more uh, competition-specific stuff. But you got to get to the level first. And so the... Taking that and and bringing it to a more, a, you know, relatable level, if you've been working out for a couple of years, you're pretty muscular, and you're trying to figure out what you need to do to keep making gains, number one, you need to eat more. You really do. And the second thing is, like, if the scale is not moving, dude, you're not making it. And you need to keep adding, like, 200, 300 calories a week until that scale starts moving. Yeah. And almost every time all by itself that's enough to watch new weight get on the bar too new reps it all happens and there's no escaping that uh the other side of it though is that you need to look at yourself you need to say okay uh am i training for gains or am i just going in and pushing weight because they're not necessarily the same thing you know am i controlling my eccentric a little bit or am i just banging it out as hard as i can and there's value to both, but moving rapidly both up and down is more of a peaking type thing where you're matching what you want to do for your performance. Whereas when you're trying to grow, you may want to control your tempo a little more. Yeah. And there are reasons for that. Part of it is damage control and part of it is balancing unavoidable damage with mechanical stimulation of growth. So when you combine those things, and that's a very complex conversation and uh but what it boils down to is that 
you are going to kind of take these different approaches and they are important to use. And that's really one of the real simple things that I find a lot of people aren't doing. And when they do it, there's comments already, just even on the body weight fitness Reddit, you see a lot of people saying, geez, man, as soon as you told me to do, you know, I did that. And like, all of a sudden, man, these three second eccentrics, I have put like 20 pounds on my pull-ups and I've been stalled forever before that. Or like with uh, Takato from the- uh, Yeah, yeah, training, he told me, he you told know? me. Yeah, it's like, these are not freaks. These are normal people. This will happen to you if you just eat more and structure your training right for the gains that you want. It really is that simple. So there's not that big of a difference in what you do I would say that the biggest difference for an individual is that they're usually going to require more training volume later in their career than they do earlier in their career. And that's why it's really stupid to say, oh, well, this study says that, you know, 20 sets are better than 10 sets. Bro, how long have you been doing 10 sets? You got to kind of work your way up and you need to see what you need. Some people never need more than like 15, 20 sets. Other people end up having huge success with like 40, 50 sets per week, but they've been working out for 15, 20 years. And you find that that volume increased at a certain point in their career, they needed it. And there's new research coming out that's suggesting that in terms of long-term upper limits, we don't know if there is one. I mean, we really don't. It's just that you see a much slower rate of increase after you get past like that, you know, 10 to 20 set range is that's really the place where when you go from 10 to 20 sets per week, you see much better gains, but you still shouldn't just say, Oh man, Naderman said 20 sets are great. So I'm just going to do 20 sets for all my body parts. Now you're going to get hurt. Probably you should be each cycle that you do in a cycle. In my opinion, should, it depends on who you are, but for most people, I would say it should be six to eight weeks, maybe 12. You do a cycle, And you say, all right, for this cycle, I'm building from like, you know, 12 sets up to 18 sets, or I'm maintaining my sets, but I'm building this many reps in them. And then I, because we like to do a rest pause thing, it's a little easier to organize and uh, it it saves a little time. And I find that it is a lot harder to get hurt. Yeah. Um, but, But that's a personal thing and your mileage may vary. The point is that your next cycle you may start at 12 sets, but you may increase your uh, your volume a little quite faster and go up to like 19. Or you may find that you start at 13 sets and go up to 20. And you just think, if you do that three times, it took you nine months to go from a range of 12 to 18 sets to a range of 15 to 21 sets. You see what I'm saying? That's almost a year just to add an average of three sets per training cycle. That's the kind of rate of progress and volume that we're talking about here you know and, and if somebody's going to sit here and try and nail that down and naderman says that if you add more than you know like one's one set every three months your body's going to fall apart that's not what i'm saying these are numbers <laughs> for examples stop being a dick and, <laughs> you know what i'm saying like use your this ears imaginary think friend with your brain this imaginary yeah, no, this person you already <laughs> yeah it's just like look you're trolling it's great you got your reaction get the fuck out <laughs> People want to make gains, learn how to make gains. And it's the concept that's important. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's that's really it. Um, that's that's the biggest difference between a beginner and, and somebody who's been working out for, you know, three, five, ten years is that that person who's been doing more is going to need to do more. All right, man. Let's move on to the next uh, question before. Yeah. Uh, so we have more enough time for them. The next one's from Roy. Roy Basil. And he asks, okay. how do you approach building strength in a total beginner in order to be able to achieve a pull-up, specifically a pull-up? Oh, yeah. I remember him talking about this on the... Um, uh, the lab. On, on, yeah, in the lab. And in the lab, he was he was talking about um, uh, someone close to him that also uh, was having some issues with that, which I think was part of why he was asking. Yeah. So... A pull-up is like anything else. You want to train the muscles that power it, and you also want to train the movement itself. And the way that I tend to do that is that for the movement training itself, uh, first I look at somebody. I'm like, look, if you're more than, you know, 
for a guy, if you're more than 20, 25% body fat and you have strength issues, maybe we should worry. Maybe we should be focusing a little more on just some basic muscle building and fat loss to get you down, you know, into like the 15 to 18% range, which is a lot more reasonable. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, for a woman, I mean, it's, it's much harder to say, but you know, I basically say like, if you're in the obese category by body fat, uh, which usually, especially for women, unless they're lifters, will also be by BMI, then you should probably consider dropping down. And that it actually still includes all the same strength work. But that would be a part of the program is that we're going to work our strength, we're going to get our protein, but because those are, those are two things that go together. And then the other thing is that we're going to drop some calories just a little so, bit for so a wait, couple wait, wait. weeks at a time. <clears throat> This is actually a question that also uh, in the lab someone asked on something similar. Uh, yeah. Could you basically do a mass cycle, you know, the training that you do for a mass mm -hmm. cycle, but then do, an, uh, do it on a caloric deficit but enough protein? Yeah, of course. So You're that's going to be weaker. Yeah, but it's, mm -hmm. it is necessary, you know, to lose that weight for, for a little bit. If, and then... if you want to keep your muscle, you, you have to train for that. You know, the, when you think about training a mass cycle, what you're really saying is that I have just signaled – as much muscle mass as I can to maintain itself and make more of itself as long as I feed it enough. Yeah. So, okay. So let's take that statement apart. I'm training it enough, right? So there's a certain amount of work that has to be done. And what that work is accomplishing is that it is signaling maintenance and growth as long as I feed it enough. So what yeah. am I feeding it? Calories and protein. Yeah. Right. Protein is a building block. Calories are energy. If you have enough of both, you are going to be growing muscle mass. And if you don't have enough of both, you're just going to maintain it. Maybe lose a small amount. So as long as you supply enough protein, your body is going to maintain pretty much everything that it's got. It may even build a small amount if you're not super huge. Yeah. And the although, I mean, that's, that's a wiggly area. It's very small if it does. But yeah, still, yeah. you don't lose anything. We know that. As long as you continue performing your strength training for mass gains, right? As, you, as long as you're performing resistance training that would otherwise make you grow and you're getting a little bit of extra protein to offset that breakdown signal that comes from not eating enough, which yeah. means that you usually have to get at least two grams per day on the low end. Most athletes are going to do better with closer to three grams per kilo per day, uh, but you figure out your sweet spot, whatever you like. And... The um, the end result is that your body basically hangs on to all its muscle and it just drops a crap ton of body fat. So you lose the same amount of weight, but it ends up all being body fat because you haven't given permission to lose the muscle. Yeah, it's kind of that's kind of the way they look at it. Is you've cut off all all of the avenues that would allow the process of oh my god I'm not eating enough let me dump my muscle off. He said no because I need it because I use it. And also, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. here's these extra building blocks. This is the stuff that it needs. And, you know, it's not just a building block. The amino acids and proteins, certain ones, are also cellular signals. They also send signals that change machinery working that, that upregulate that maintenance process and mm -hmm. downregulate the process of tagging things for destruction that don't otherwise need to be tagged. So you're preventing unnecessary breakdown. And those two combinations are the key to keeping it. So when you when you look at the fat loss, that's how we approach it. Yeah. And that's how everybody who is routinely successful with people who historically have a hard time, that's how they approach it. It's going to be high protein. It's going to be resistance training at least twice a week, usually three times a week or more with each body part and then they maintain a caloric deficit through a combination of exercise and food whatever works for that person you do those things your fat falls off <clears throat> yeah yeah okay cool but moving back to the I'm question not saying it's easy it's just simple yeah uh, but moving yeah. back to the question uh well, that brings us to the pull-up right yeah to the pull-up okay uh, so we, we talked about the body mass part as far yeah. as pure strength and form training yeah, what I exercises, like, if you yeah, can do pull-up, what exercise would you do? So, I mean, you can do anything that trains your, you know, your, you can do any combination of rows and pull-downs, really, to build your mass. But mm -hmm. what I would do, and what I typically do with people, 
is that we have most of our training, excuse me, is actually going to be on the pull-up bar. And so what I have them do is I have them hold themselves in like a chin up, you know, whatever, I don't care. I am not a grit person. I don't really care what you like. I mean, if you have certain goals, like a muscle up, you're going to need to learn to do this. But in the beginning, it's whatever. So go somewhere you're comfortable. Hold yourself to where, you know, looking at it from the side, your, your hands, the bar is, my rule is that you should be able to look into my eyes from above the bar. I don't actually care if the bar is touching you. That's one of those weird things that people have in their heads that people have done in YouTube videos, and it does look cool. Uh, it's not necessarily good for everybody, and it's also not strictly necessary. Um, and if you do good training over time, you'll be able to do that if you if you start with what I'm telling you and just keep a little bit of it up. But if yeah. that's what you want, that's an extreme version of what we're teaching here, is that instead of just being there, you would also make sure that the bar is actually you know touching your collarbone. Because if it's there, you can definitely look down over it, right? Same thing with the pull-up is you hold it to where it needs to be for you to accomplish your goals. Whether it's just the height thing or whether it's the height and having it against your your, your uh, chest, right? So then you hold there. You may need to have your foot in a band. You may need to have your foot on the ground. You may need to have your foot on a bench. There are a lot of different ways for you to figure out how to spot yourself appropriately. You wanna go for a 10 to 15 second hold. At first it might be three seconds, then you start losing position. Just put your foot down. Abort the rep, take a minute of rest, and do it again. And you just keep doing that. And usually at first I start off with like five or six holds and that's all we do for that first day and that first week. We'll do that twice during the week. Here's what happens. As soon as they get to where they have a 10 to 15 second hold and they tell me, you know what? These are feeling good. And even, even if they are still using a little bit of foot support, I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna do two things. One, we're gonna start working on it like a hold with less foot support. We're gonna, we're gonna try and make it harder while maintaining a good position, take it back down to a five second hold. So now we're working on our strength and, and when that starts failing, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we go back to the assistance. And I want you to just work a range of motion that you feel like you can return to with good form. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can't just jump people all the way in. That comes later. And so what happens is that this becomes this, where I do have people stay about 30, like, you know, 20, 30 degrees around the range of motion that they're currently limited at. So if they can start here on the bar and they lower down to about halfway, then I don't want them to come all the way back up. I would rather have them stay here and really get comfortable learning the pull in that area, focusing their strength training on where they're weak because they've already got strength up here. And this also happens to be a shorter muscle length. It's gonna give them less gains. So they're better off staying here and they actually get stronger faster. And I've done this a lot of times and every single time when I get people to just focus on that range they need to strengthen, it works better. You start <clears> up here, you do like a three second hold and then you go down. And when you reach that limit, limit where you say, if I go any further, I'm gonna lose it. Then you pull back up a bit, not all the way back up unless you're only going down to here, which happens. And so what happens is that over time, you're ending up going, you know, doing what most people would consider a full pull-up. It's coming down most of the way and coming back up. And you're like, dude, I'm kind of repping these things out now. And then you say, well, I want to get the rest of the way down. Just keep the process up. Go down here and same thing. Pulse it there. You know, it's the same thing. You pull, control down, pull, control down, pull, control down. And when you feel like you're going to start losing it, you just go the rest of the way down to the hang and just hold it for a little bit and then get off. And what you find is that without putting a whole lot of effort into fancy exercises or having to run over machines or whatever else, you can actually get the results that you want. Some people don't nice. feel good doing that. And for them, I'll say, okay, we're going to do the strength part of this. And then uh, we'll go ahead and just 
do another uh, set of exercises on machines or just whatever they want to do. We'll do rows. I don't really care what somebody's preferences are as long as what we're doing is moving us forward. Yeah. And then, yeah, and, and you know, sometimes it's not the fastest way, but it makes them happy, and they're still getting things they're going to carry over to other exercises. So it's all good. And if they want things to be more specific, we can make them more specific. The most specific would be really to do all that work on the bar and do it in the grip that you want to do it. All and right, man. You, you do your eating. Yeah, of course. You take your rest days, you know. I mean, it's like the normal stuff. Just the normal stuff. All right, that's cool. Moving mm-hmm. on to the, the next question. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really, it's the same way that I would have people do push-ups and a lot of other things is that, you know, you're... These concepts are fairly universal. Same thing with deadlifts, you know. It's no matter no matter what you take a look at, you're always better off working your way into a range of motion than you are trying to just do assisted stuff that lets you move all the way through it. They can both be useful, but if you don't have control over that range of motion, what the hell are you doing? Just work your way in. You'll have it. It's easy that way. I'm not saying it's the only way, and other people will have success doing that combination of full range and partial stuff. It's th- There's a lot of ways to get there. But if you find that that's not working well for you, I think you should just switch over and be a little more specific and work on that bottom part of the range where you're having problems. Before you know it, you're going to be stronger than you think. You're going to be doing that exercise and looking for the next progression. All right, man. Moving on to the next question. Thanks for answering that one. This one is uh, from Ansi Lipak, uh, and he asks, any advice on how to motivate family and friends to be more physically active? Now, Josh has actually uh, he's got his father to uh, be more physically active, and I've been trying to get my brother, my uh, uh, sister, my father, basically the whole family to, get, to become more uh, active, and I'm finally getting through them. Uh, but Josh, what did you do to get your dad to... Uh, well, the first thing I did is I got him off of a mountain and onto something where he could walk. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Yeah, you know, we moved to a horse farm. We have, uh, we're on the top of a hill, but it's fairly flat. And so he's able to walk around and he's outside like four or five hours a day. So he likes that. He's out in the woods, like picking branches up and piling them up. He's 87, by the way. And yep. it's kind of kind of scary sometimes but i mean he's really his balance has improved enormously and he likes it and that's the key the key is you have to find things that people like so, yes yes you can't yeah. just throw them in the gym and expect them to have fun a lot of people don't like the gym i know it sounds crazy but, but they don't they like, don't the like being in the gym alone <laughs> that too that too uh but what ha- what also helped for me so my um uh <laughs> my sister-in-law i helped her she wants a six pack so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I can, I can, I can help with that. And within two weeks, you'll have pretty decent results already. So I gave her some advice. She saw the results helped, and now my brother's like, how did you do that? I want that too. And now my <laughs> mother's the same. Like, how did you? What? What's going on here? And now I finally got my whole family to uh, finally, you know, take up yeah, my yeah. advice. You know, I've been giving people some advice, but I couldn't give advice to my family. It's so crazy sometimes. Yeah, but, that's uh, one of the other things. You have to wait until they're hungry. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's not you don't hold things back when they ask, but uh, keep it simple and um, make a low bar for entry. Very and, low bar, yeah. Yeah, and don't try and force people because it'll make them hate something they may otherwise love. Exactly, yeah, nice. I think, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that covers it, covers uh, the question. Yeah, it's uh, tricky. I know it's it's not a lot to say, but I mean, there's no... No, but that's, that's basically yeah. it. Yeah, just say, hey, you know, and when people really enjoy your company, they'll make themselves a little uncomfortable to hang out. And so, you know, you say, look, I'm busy. I'm just, I'm, you know, it's nice. I'm going to take a walk and then I'm going to have to go do something. I want to spend some time with you. Just will you come on part of my walk? You don't even need to finish it with me. And then don't say anything else. Just get out, see if they'll come out with you. And, and don't worry about it. If they don't want to go, it's like, all right, cool. I'll see you tomorrow or, you know, whatever. And um, you give them a hug. And, uh, Always give them a hug. Thing. It's part yeah, of the, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's part of, part you of the show protocol. Love. You, know, you got to remember, you're not sitting here <laughs> trying to be the bad guy here. You just you just want to go and you're living your life. Yeah. If they want to be a part of your life, you can make it to where it's just mild physical activity. And before they know it, sometimes they really like that. 
And then if you really, if it's just not going to happen, then you're going to need to make time for them if you want them in your life. And that may mean that you sit on your ass on the couch with them. You can't fix everybody. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the next question from Lucas Sam. Sampia, Sampaio? Sampaio, I mm-hmm. think that's it. Yeah, uh, he says, uh, thanks for reading my question, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we I have, have very l- polite people. <laughs> <laughs> They're so polite. It's I nice. love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of strength-related goals, especially straight arm ones, but almost all of them are upper body ones. Is it possible that the leg mass obtained might be detrimental to these upper body goals? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're putting ankle weights on. Basically, that's just, what's Just happening. think about it like that. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You know, if you're not going to be like making millions of dollars or, you know, a substantial second income or something off of what you're doing with just your upper body, and then there's no reason to not pursue lower body goals too. You know, if you have high level goals, then you've got to be smart about what you do because muscle is hard to build, but also kind of hard to lose. Yeah. And yeah, once you got it and once you got new satellite cells incorporated in, that muscle hangs around. So that's my it, issue because I, 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 I really enjoy deadlifting, squatting, and everything. But on the other side, I do want the world record from lever hold. <laughs> so what do you do? Yeah. So I don't, for me, I decided simply uh, if I'm going to focus on gymnastic strength for the, you know, the first 10 years or 20 years. Uh, till I'm forty something, and then or thirty, and then afterwards, if I I, f- I feel like you know doing some powerlifting and shit, I just do that. But that's afterwards. Yeah. So for and now, I'll just try to do crazy crazy moves. Yeah, and it's you know if your priorities change, your workouts change. That's just life. Yeah, you just gotta mm-hmm. set priorities. That's basically uh, the gist of this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So don't let the fact that something might be a little more difficult keep you from doing it. That's a garbage reason unless it's actually going to get in the way of something you just can't live without. You know what I mean? That's, that's the it. only time that it's a good reason. Yeah, that's it. All right, moving on to the next question. This one's from Jay Taylor. This is a this one is a, a bit medical question, so I think uh that's interesting. Uh what modifications if any would you make to your nutritional suggestions for someone with reactive hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia. I'm I'm a non-diabetic, but I have oh, low blood sugar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Switching to keto has helped, Hypoglyce- but it's yeah. very low uh, carb. Yeah, sorry, I, I it's 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 a, a, it's a soft C. It's an English thing. Yeah. Well, I you know, there's not a whole lot to it. When you got to remember that your only two hard and fast rules are get enough calories for your goal and get enough protein for your goal. So what I would do is you probably have already kind of gotten a pretty good idea of what works for you in terms of avoiding crashes. And you may also realize that sometimes they're unavoidable, which means you should make sure that they happen in a safe place. Seriously. I mean, you can't, you can't control everything all the time, but when you know your triggers, when you know that, okay, if I go, I don't know, you know, run for 20 minutes and then have a power bar Then 30 minutes later, I'm going to fall over, so I better make sure I'm home. That's not a good idea, right? You're playing with your life. You're playing with time. But so, So you just have to time things out, and you just have to say, well, this is what works for me, and so that's what I'm going to do. Just focus on the basics and be super flexible with all the details. Do what you need. That's that. That's my advice. I mean, that's that that's what I would do. All right, cool. Hope that answered the question, Jay. Moving on to the, I think the last question, man. And then we covered literally all the questions from the AMA. If you didn't get your question in, it's because we had some issues with the AMA um with the AMA box. So make sure to send them in now, and we will answer them. So, but now moving on to the last question, Spencer Hazard. Is a question for me and one for you. Uh, so first off, hey guys, really excited for the site. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, I was wondering if you guys are planning on setting a schedule when stuff is going to be released. Um, so I, I, I'm I, kind of on top of that. I'm the person who uh, s- decides on what's going to be released first. So right now we're getting in the flow of, of releasing uh, at least one article uh, a week. Some weeks, two articles. 
and we're based and one per month one AMA podcast and we're planning on doing more different kinds of podcasts in the future. We're planning on making more videos and basically depending on on how you guys respond and what you guys want, we'll release based on that. So uh, keep sending us your feedback. We really appreciate it. You don't know how much we appreciate it. It's it's amazing. So thank you for all the feedback. Keep doing that and we are reading all of it. Uh, the next question was also when you guys talk about cutting const- when you guys talk about cutting you constantly mention to use a TDEE calculators online do you have any specific recommendations because a lot of them give wildly different results thanks so that's that's interesting to me um, cuz they shouldn't right yeah most of the ones that i've plugged into don't really say a huge difference there might be a 10% difference so the short version is that um i honestly i think i don't know i'd have to search it i i think that i use the one that's um when i mock stuff up a lot of times i just go to the iffym dot like if it fits your macros calculator oh yeah yeah, yeah. is is a pretty good one so what's that i i think it's i i think it's iff uh I- it? F- if it i i f y m yeah, if it fits your macros. Yeah, I I F Y M dot com or net or something. I'll link it in the article for you guys, so you yeah. can uh, check that out. Well, we should be having one before too long. Um, yeah, we're we're making our own soon, but for now we'll put this yeah. one in, and then later on we'll replace it and with our. We'll, we'll own. have some more. We'll have like a simple mode and an advanced mode where you can be more specific, and that does help. Uh, and we'll also be co- including some modifiers for people who have been dieting for a long time. Or otherwise feel like if they eat what a calculator tells them is their uh, uh, requirements that they start gaining weight. There's reason for that. It's essentially mitochondrial and efficient or, well, excessive efficiency, oddly enough. Um, And that's a subject for a different time. But there are modifications we can use to help you get past the issues that you may have with certain things. The biggest thing is just, just these these calculators are not meant to be like weird digital mind readers. They're there to give you a guide stone and yeah. to say, this is a place to start looking. From there, I would suggest a semi-flexible approach. And what I mean by that is instead of driving yourself crazy with math, start making a 200 calorie cut if you're gaining weight. So if, you're, if it tells you you need 2,700 and that's what you're getting and you're actually, you know, I hate to say counting, but you do need to be counting in one way or another. Uh, I usually teach a measuring scoop method because it's accurate and easy and doesn't require a scale. But any way you want to do it is fine. So even if it's like Nutrisystem, you know, and you get the Nutrisystem and you're getting like 1,800 calories and you're like, crap, I just gained two pounds this month. Uh, Well, that means that you were eating a little too much. So knock 200 pounds off. Or sorry, not 200 pounds (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You'd be like a negatives, be made out of helium or something. Negative um, being. <laughs> Listen, man, going from nights to days to nights is awful. Yeah, we'll um, talk about that in a sec. But keep dude, going. <laughs> the um, yeah. So what I meant to say was, just knock out like uh, you know, two hundred calories. That's a little over a ten percent difference. It's enough, and then see what happens. And then if you're still gaining, knock off another one. Just don't go below like, you know, 1,200 calories. That's that's just not a lot of food. You can't get the nutrients that you need. It's not a healthy long-term solution. Um, <clears throat> so wait, well, that's an interesting yeah. question, actually. I, I want to talk about that with you. What if, what if you take all your supplements, you know, like you take your multivitamins, you take mm-hmm. your uh, essential uh, amino acids, your proteins, your your fat, essential fats, whatever, everything. Mm-hmm. And that's around 1,200 calories. You know, you take that all from supplements. Is that like wh- what happens? I don't know what you mean. Oh, oh, yeah. Like yes. if you're trying to cut. Well, yeah. So that's, a, that's kind all- of a first off, that wouldn't happen. I mean, it's not possible. Is um, it not possible to get under 1,200 when you so take- here's the problem, uh, and this gets into some stuff that we're releasing on the uh, nutrition side, but you can absorb almost infinite amounts of 
you know, fat and carbohydrates. There are limits. If anybody tells you there's not, they haven't been to Bud's. Okay, I was eating 14,000 calories a day, and honestly, my poops were not that much bigger than normal, but I'm kind of like a monster pooper anyways. But 14,000 or 1,400? Yeah, 14,000. Dude, what? Yeah, no, and I know people are calling bullshit on this. Here is the deal. (laughs) So I had a six-pack of Insure Plus. Each one of those is 350 calories, so I would drink two in the morning, two in the afternoon after training was done, and two before bed. Additionally, I ate two entire boxes of Girl Scout cookies every day because for unknown reasons, one of my half sisters was super cool and bought, I I think she got like an entire pallet of Girl Scout cookies. And so, I mean, they came in faster than I could give them away almost, you know? So I I went through like, is that why it happened? I mean, that's 14, that's like 14 uh, boxes of Girl Scout cookies a week. I mean, each box is about 2000 calories. Some of them like the, the peanut butter ones that with the chocolate on top. I love those things. Those were like 2,400. So Dude. you just just from cookies and ensure was over six thousand calories. Just how you, that. How do you keep eating? You understand? Like in breakfast, I had two trays. I mean, yeah, but I've always been able to do this. Like there are people who get nauseous for an I hour get nauseous. after a meal, they do something. I'm the guy who was running ten miles while eating a steak. That's just me. <laughs> I've always I used to do it to screw with people. Because they were like, no, I'm sorry, something's wrong with you, sir. And I would just say, you're probably right, but I'm going to still outrun you. And I did. And that was just what I could do, you know. And it's, uh, I hate to sound like I'm bragging. It was, it was very Do you not have, a, like, a saturation meter in your head? Like, do you not I don't get... know, man. No, you know, it was hard. But also, you got to realize we're getting up. It's like, you know, whatever. On Especially that first Monday was awful. But um, I think we got up at, like, 4 in the morning. We're on the grinder by 5. We were just working out nonstop. And when I say working out, it's like doing push-ups, running to the water, getting wet and sandy, crawling back in times that you can't do. So you're just constantly doing it over and over and over again for two hours. Then you run a mile to breakfast and you run a mile back. Then you go run around with the boats for like two hours, paddling and you know lifting and holding them over your head and just being miserable and cold. And then you go to the logs. You spend two hours with the logs and you go on like a five-mile run. Then you come back and do boats again. And somewhere in there, we went to lunch, which is another mile there and back. And then you, uh, trying to think. Holy crap, man. So yeah, that was, you ended up using those calories then, if you think about it. Yeah. And, and, and and that's the other thing is that even 14,000 may not have been enough. I don't know. I have not sat down and tried to calculate how many calories I, I was really burning. It's probably pretty close, but I can tell you this. I was 211 pounds throughout Indoc. And as soon as day one hit of first phase, between day one and uh, med checks for Hell Week, I had gone from 211 to 197. And that was eating enormous amounts of food every single day. And like Wednesday nights at Island Pasta, were, uh, they, there was, I forget the price, but it was like unlimited pasta. And we would just wreck that place, man. They'd be like out of noodles. And it was just... There is such a thing as not being able to get enough. But for, you know, what you got to realize is that you can transport upwards of 60 grams of carbs an hour. I think I think the limit is more like 90 or 100 per hour, something crazy like that. <sighs> Fatty acids are uh, your body kind of has to adapt by making more bile, but um, you can also get quite a lot of fats in per hour. So you can easily get like a thousand calories from carbs and fats or close to it. But proteins, uh, typically you can't really get for an average sized person. You can't, uh, at least according to all the data that we have, you don't absorb more than around 12 grams of, uh, amino acids per hour. And there's a lot that goes into that. Some of it is just a limit on the, and a lot of it really is a limit on the rate of digestion. How fast <clears throat> does it get out of your stomach? How fast can your enzymes break it down? And how long is it in the absorptive areas of your intestines? Those combination of factors determine how much of that protein you can get. And carbs and fat, but there's just, you can get the others way faster. Um, so we get into more a little more detail on that, but what you need to know is that you just put that into calorie terms. Let's say that there's some kind of adaptation process and that a big dude could get like 20 grams per hour. Bro, that's 
what? A total per day of 480 grams of protein. Okay? That would be absurd. That, that's of actual absorption. All right? Less than half of which is going to be used for energy. So you're talking about in terms of the maximum absorbed energy you could actually get from dietary protein is, you know, if you said 480, if you're going to use a standard four multiplier, then that's 1820. Half of that's, so call it 900 calories from um, amino acid oxidation. Okay, let me put this into hourly terms. That's like, what is that? 45, like 38 ish, uh, I think, grant, uh, calories per hour. And that's not including the thermal effect of food. You know, every, every hundred calories of protein that you eat, it, you, you end up burning like 35, uh, like 30 ish, 35, uh, it kind of depends on the amino acid content, but you burn a lot just to break it down and get it places and use it for calories. So, it is a very inefficient and limited source of energy. And because of that, it's very hard to get fat off of protein alone, which is part of why, you know, when they say things like, oh, a calorie isn't a calorie necessarily, there's there's kind of truth to that uh, in a limited degree. It mostly only applies to proteins um, because you have a limited absorption and they're used for so many things that you just don't use that much, you know? So anyways... The, the, the point here is that if you got all of that stuff, hypothetically, if you could get all of your calories from supplements alone, and it was literally everything that you needed and you were maintaining weight, then anything extra that you ate would probably cause you to gain weight. But I, I'm not sure, you, you, would just, you would just have to, it would be so hard. Cause like for me, even at those massive numbers, let's say that magically, my body burned all that protein, burned 480 grams of protein for energy, which is not going to happen. It's it's not chemically possible because of our absorption uh, limitations and the fact that they're used that the proteins are used for so many other things. Yeah. But let's pretend that didn't happen. That was still less than 2,000 calories, bro. If I lay in bed all day, I burn 2,400. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's okay. what I'm saying. A regular day, I still need like 3,500 calories, and I'm not even working out that. Like, Bro, you're not efficient, man. Why do you live? So that's that's what I'm saying. And we should have so, more yards, less Joshuas. Yeah. I, I don't I don't use up that it's, much, it's, man. It's 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 hard being big, just like Sebastian. <laughs> I mean, you know, can you imagine. He's for for the people who don't know, Sebastian is one of our athletes, and he weights about 128 kilos now, maybe 130. God. Maybe he reached 130, but he's two meter three, and he's buff. Yeah, for you Americans or uh, you know non-metric people, that's six foot eight, and um, is he really close to 130? He's very close to 130. Oh my god! Well, so let's pretend like he's actually 120. We'll say he's like one 126 or something. Yeah. Oh well, he has been 128. He actually has been steady really? on 128. Yeah. All right, so that's over 280 pounds. He is a monster. He doesn't look like it either. He, he looks like, like a sweet guy. No, he's he just and then he, he stands honestly, up. He just and looks then... like like me scaled up, and yeah. that makes him so. Because I don't think of myself as being big, especially because I know what I used to be. But um, he's huge, man. Like his arms are bigger than a normal person's head. It is. Ridiculous. His arms are bigger than my torso, my bro. <laughs> like, it's, it's so crazy. It and is. he's so strong. You know, and that's the, the, the problem with being super big and especially being somebody who gains mass. Like, he gains mass in his legs from walking. I mean, <laughs> like, he's not you – know, some people don't. Most people don't. But he, I don't. He's kind of like one of those, like, uh, what, what's the um, the mountain's name? Like Half Thor, Bjornsson, or whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I butchered that badly, and I'm sorry, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know what you mean. I, everyone knows what you mean. He's one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Is what it is. A ribbed version. So, yeah, he's 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 big. He's he he'll he'll definitely end up cutting down to like 120 or something but still well, he's actually going for 135 or something i think and then afterwards cut down 
Yeah, and, and he will, and, and he will keep that muscle and be terrifying to look at. Like, he'll just be like, if he dyed his hair green, he would look like Brawly. That's yeah. what he is. That's how big yes. he is. Yes. Is he is like the legendary Super Saiyan big. Yeah. That's that's not a, that's, that's fact. That's yeah. It's fact. It's really something. And I like standing like, next to, like, I've known this guy for four or five years, and every time I see him, I kid you not, you can ask him. The, one, the first thing I say, I don't say, hey. I only say, hey, you're big. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's normal. It's like, that's, that's the only thing I say. It's like, for four years, I've been saying that every time we meet up, even when I call him. I feel like you could almost say, hey, you're bigger. <laughs> well, that's Why? A little... <laughs> and Yad's looking up about like this, too. It's like my neck hurts when I'm chilling with that guy. So you gotta imagine, they should walk. And then he asks me questions. Like, we're in the gym together. Everyone's like, who's this big guy? And, and, and he ducks down, like, mm-hmm. Yod, is this plainly good? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> no, you gotta do this. <laughs> he's <laughs> making a lot of progress. You know, he's he's a super, super smart guy. Uh, but he's, he's a very introspective person. And there's a lot of people like him out there. And, uh, and, one of the biggest things that's kept him from moving forward and it keeps a lot of people listening, I think from moving forward is, is trying to analyze things so deeply that you get uh, paralyzed kind of. Yeah. Like, or, or you get, it's not even that you get paralyzed, like you're moving, but you're focused on the wrong thing because you're, you're so intent on this detail that caught your attention that you sort of, got away from the basics that mattered like i mean you used to do that a lot protein and then you know the external cues like yeah just you know steel rod through the spine so to speak is a great cue because all you're thinking of is a steel rod you're not thinking of anything else and then where my like i'm holding the ground so i'm thinking about the ground and i'm just letting myself I'm letting the ground get closer and I'm pushing it away while I keep the steel rod straight. And if you just do those things, you free up all of your muscles to work together. And it's, it's one of the reasons that like in bench press, bending the bar works so well, or like trying to twist your, your hands and things like that during the pushups, they work so well because they focus your attention into a specific area that allows you to create tension throughout your body without thinking about any of those parts. And yeah. that's the key to high level performance, you know? So yeah. Anyway, we, we got to wrap this up, man. Cause it's sleep time for you. It's 1530 here. So I've got, that's, I've got to go to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. DMV. I've got to get my uh, Virginia license. All right, man. Then we will wrap this up. I hope you guys like this episode, uh, sending your questions and we keep answering them and uh, happy gains guys. Have a good yeah. one. Thanks for tuning in.